something very interesting. Uh, one, the first uh, speaker will be Dr. Andra Sekar, the chief of our pathology, and who has been extensively working on GI pathology now more into the other branches. And now there's a renewed interest in artificial intelligence. So she'll tell us about the utility of artificial intelligence in the pathology lab. And uh, her talk will be followed by uh, uh, something uh, called uh, use of ultrasound and its application in several diagnostic uh, therapeutic applications. And that would be spoken by Dr. Abhinash Sheranki from IIT Hyderabad. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, did his PhD from Utrecht University. And he has been working extensively on uh, use of ultrasound in diagnostic and therapeutic domains and has several interesting things which he'll be sharing today. So first I'd like to call upon Dr. Anwarha for her talk. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so after the uh, introduction given by Dr. G. Rao sir on the role of uh, artificial intelligence in the medical field, um, so today we'll talk on the what is the role of pathologist and why we need AI. So as Roop said, we've been practicing GI pathology from a long time, so I think we can rely on human brain, but maybe we need AI for other specialties to go ahead. Uh, so uh, in my talk, I'll just say what. What, as a pathologist, what's our day-to-day -day job? What's the evolution of technology? What is the updates uh, in uh, pathology in uh, in relation to digitization and how it has paved the path to AI and how AI is going to help us in our future? So as we all know, pathology is a bridge between the basic science and clinical medicine and pathology uh, forms a bridge between um, all the clinical subjects uh, connecting the clinical and uh, surgical domains. So, um, we have an integral part in almost um, every branch from diagnosis to therapeutics to uh, to further management of the patient. Um, so a pathologist uh, uh, will base the diagnosis based on inputs from the clinician, uh, based on the patient's symptoms, clinical findings, radiological images, and then based on the diagnosis, the clinician ultimately will decide whether the patient needs therapy or needs minimal therapy or needs aggressive treatment. So diagnosis in pathology is done on blood samples, on biopsy samples, and then we use further ancillary studies like IHC, FISH, flow cytometry, and molecular studies. Um, so there has been a lot of uh, uh, updates, even in the Time magazine has says that pathology has grown beyond their horizons, and uh, we play a critical role in um, healthcare. And uh, so we'll, uh, today we'll uh, talk on what is the role of um, pathologist, um, in particularly with the tissue samples and oncopathology. Um, a routine workflow of a pathologist involves a procurement of the tissue, processing of the tissue, creating slides, and then interpreting the slides by the pathologist. So the role of pathologist is to diagnose the cancer, relate the cancer, stage the tumor, evaluate frozen sections if at all the patient is taken up for surgery, at the time of um, surgery to say whether the margins are clear or are we dealing with a metastatic lesion or what is the... Uh, the extent of the tumor, for example, in radical, uh, if the surgeon wants to convert the surgery to a radical cholecystectomy, the role of pathologist is to identify not only the presence of the tumor, but look at the extent of the tumor spread. And if it has gone beyond the muscle layer into perimuscular connective tissue, it's an indication to the um, surgeon that the disease might have spread much more than what is evident macroscopically. So there are chances that there could be infiltration into the liver. There are chances that there could be infiltration into the lymph nodes. So this needs upgradation of the surgery and performing a radical um, surgery. And then pathologist also does biomarkers and helps the clinician to choose the best treatment uh, protocol and then predict the response and further also to monitor the response. So in pathology, there's a lot of advances. We have got uh, modern equipment um, which are now fully automated uh, from tissue processors to tissue stainers um, to advanced um, bedding machines uh, even on the hematology side we have fully automated machines so what does this fully automated machine mean so do they give us an answer or is there any need of the pathologist even then yes the fully automated analysis for example have used or have integrated ai into them and they are able to 
uh, give an idea to the pathologist that yes, there could be a possible lymphoblast, there could be a possible uh, monoblast or there could be some malarial parasite. So, which the percentage of cells which might be so less, which can be missed by the human eye. So, the machine helps the pathologist to look at those smears more carefully to identify the area of interest. And uh, on a basic uh, pathology level, we have used various special stains to help us. And these are either to identify the bacilli or identify the parasite or we use mucin stains to know if it's a mucin producing tumor. We use meson trichrome to evaluate fibrosis, particularly in case of uh, liver, uh, wherein uh, it plays a crucial role to know the extent of fibrosis. So there have been various technology breakthroughs in uh, pathology and the first uh, breakthrough was in 1980 with the introduction of uh, immunohistochemistry which has been widely accepted now and plays a very key role in uh, oncopathology and the second one is the introduction of the NGS in 2010 and the third is the artificial intelligence in 2018. And in between, we have also got the immunofluorescence, which plays a very key role in diagnosing all the kidney and the uh, skin lesions, based on which we are able to, uh, based on the deposits, we are able to identify like IgA nephropathy, etc. Now, IHC, we have panel of markers which can range uh, from more than 200 markers. But do these markers help us to come to a diagnosis? No, ultimately, again, it's the pathologist who has to decide what markers to keep. And by using these IHCs, we can uh, try to define what is the primary organ. For example, a patient comes with ascites, um, ascitic fluid and uh, a large uh, volume ascites or uh, quickly forming ascites is indicated that there is some neoplastic etiology. So, we can prepare cell blocks and we can do IHCs and we can try to know what could be the probable primary whether it is originating from GI tract or female genital tract and this will... Um, and by this tissue, we can also further do molecular analysis on this. Uh, and the um, other one is the, the fish analysis, uh, which is uh, a test which basically maps the genetic material in the cells. And uh, this is widely used in breast cancers and uh, lung cancers. Um, for example, the HER2 and the EGFR. And uh, this is an example where we also use fish in the hematological malignancies. Um, not only it is enough that you have to diagnose it's a case of acute leukemia, but you are also able to prognosticate it further and for treatment further to know what are the most common translocations which that uh, patient might be manifesting and uh, based on which whether he needs further therapy. For example, uh, for AMS, we sometimes um, uh, make an effort to look for these uh, 922, 119, 1221 translocations by fish. So just to show a case capsule of uh, prostate cancer on what is the role of a pathologist. Now whenever a patient has elevated PSA levels, uh, a sex stent biopsy that is uh, multiple biopsies from different quadrants uh, are taken by the urologist both from the right lobe and left lobe and we get um, different uh, uh, biopsy specimens. So again, if you see here, the specimens are long linear course, it's easier for the pathologist, but the more crushed they are, it becomes difficult for us to analyze the tissue uh, because of the fragmentation. And also if you just take a look at the tray here, these are the number of slides which we might get from one patient to evaluate for prostatic cancer. So uh, when we get a trust biopsy, the role of the pathologist is to evaluate what is the tumor and what is the tumor grade. And this we will give based on the pattern which we are seeing, which is called as the glisten pattern. And then we give a score, which is called the glisten score. And then we give a final grade group. So what is the importance of this uh, grade group? Now, this is mainly used for risk stratification of the patient. So you have five grades. If it is grade one, it indicates the patient is a very low risk group. If it is grade two, that is uh, two or three, he falls under intermediate. So you can see that grade two, and 3 both have a glycine score of 7 but it depends on the proportion of score 3 and 4. 3 plus 4 forms glycine score 7 which is grade group 2 which has a favorable prognosis against grade group 3 which is also glycine score of 7 but has an unfavorable prognosis and 4 and 5 are high risk. So when there is so much of difference in the pattern which can lead to abnormal prognostication of the patient, it is very important that you have an expert pathologist and an experienced pathologist who are able to uh, evaluate this on morphology. And uh, this is how based on the morphological patterns, for example, if you see the first image, if you have well-formed glands, 
will give a score of 3. But if you see uh, the adjacent uh, figure, so if there are few uh, plants, that means it is going into a pattern of 4. So then that means uh, the pathologist has to make uh, an identification of what is the score and also quantify based on which will give a final glissance uh, scoring. So this sort of scoring can have inter and intra observer variation which can impact the patient uh, uh, therapy. And also then we have to quantify the percentage of the tumor. So when we get such long linear course, we have to evaluate every nook and corner of the biopsy to look for the percentage of the tumor, whether it is uh, involving the entire core or it's only 10% or 20% and whether it is continuous or whether it is discontinuous, whether there is um, what is the score, whether there is perineural infiltration, is there any extra prosthetic extension, that is if there is any fat and if there is any extra prosthetic extension, we are giving an indirect and a direct information to the urologist that hey this person has a higher grade, almost the stage T3B because there is extra prosthetic extension, so that means he is a candidate who has to go for radical prosthetic. So the amount and time taken to evaluate such specimens is very laborious and very tedious and then these specimens will be further, you will undergo radical prostatectomies and radical prostatectomy for each patient, we generate almost 102 slides. So as much time as a surgeon takes to operate, a pathologist takes to cross the specimen and another pathologist takes to screen and then as you know, screening 102 slides, they can be human error. So there is a need for a specialty and a specialist to uh, look for and uh, that makes it to have a, uh, a good um, and uh, two pathologists to observe in such critical cases. So with this, if you can see the explosion of the data in AIG hospitals from 2004, where we had 2,200 samples per year, currently we are getting around 39,500 samples. So imagine the number of slides, number of blocks and the amount of data and the amount, amount of work. So and the challenges are we don't have adequate pathologists and we don't have adequate specialist pathologists. When you compare from uh, USA and Canada where they have one pathologist, uh, 40 to 50 pathologists uh, when compared to India where we have less than 10. So uh, and this um, also means that then for uh, correct diagnosis there is this role of telepathology wherein you use um, services of an expert pathologist elsewhere to get a, a definitive diagnosis for uh, optimal management of the patient and this uh, telepathologist, um, uh, telepathology can be dynamic, it can be static or it can be hybrid. So uh, dynamic is when you are using a remote controlled microscope that allows the pathologist with a live view of the distant microscopic image but still it gives them control of the stage focus and magnification as in we have in our AIG hospitals. So on the right side you can see the technician at the time of EUS or EBUS for rapid on-site evaluation where a technician will stain the material given by the pulmonologist or by the gastroenterologist and he will stain it and he will mount it on this uh, microscope which is there in the second uh, floor endoscopy room and same time a pathologist sitting in the pathology room in tower B can monitor those slides and we can, uh, we can change the field uh, dynamically and we are able to give an opinion. So this is dynamic pathology for rapid on-site evaluation. Static is what we a single pathologist would see, take with the camera and try to identify the areas and send to another pathologist which can vary because she may not uh, miss the exact site. This has led to the way for digital pathology which is a whole slide image um, where the entire slide is uh, scanned and you do not miss uh, any part uh, of the biopsy uh, for diagnosis. And also COVID has paved the path for uh, the digital pathology which has been FDA approved for practice in routine life and uh, this has been um, approved by the College of American Pathologists and the Royal College of uh, Pathologists and uh, what is digital pathology? So basically it's a branch of pathology which focuses on the data which is based on the digital slides. That is all the slides are scanned in a machine and you get the digitalized uh, slide. And uh, this um, can be sent to multiple people at the same time. Multiple uh, pathologists in the same uh, department can view one slide at the same time. You can map the area, you can um, uh, annotate the images, you can uh, discuss. It is used for uh, various purposes. And for this, you need um, an efficient um, uh, 
uh, information systems in place and a cloud space uh, to help you with this. And we have this uh, digital pathology unit at uh, AIG hospitals and uh, this advantages are you have seen that so many slides, so many blocks can be reduced. You can um, use um, specialist opinion, you can reduce turnaround time, you can give more precise and reproducible histomorphological evaluation. You can educate and train the pathologist. So, for example, this is a slide which is scanned by the scanner. You can see that the entire slide is available to us, and you can see every nook and corner, and you can. Um, use it for identifying uh, every area and also since these machines have you can even measure the depth of uh, infiltration which is very important for example in EMR ESDs you know that when you do a um, uh, EMR ESD if the depth of uh, tumor infiltration the esophagus squamous cell carcinomas is more than 200 microns that means the patient has to go for additional surgery if the infiltration is less than 200 microns it indicates that it is a completely performed EMR ESD. So, those um, details can also be uh, done with the help of this uh, digital platform. Uh, and also, during the uh, frozen evaluation, it forms a very important, um, histopathology forms a very important uh, decision making. For example, if you take the brain tumor surgeries, a normal frozen takes 30 to 40 minutes uh, to prepare the slide and to report. And uh, sometimes you may not have a specialist neuropathologist. So, there are some tools which have come here, which is called microscopy with ultraviolet surface excitation or the MUSE or the stimulated Raman histology or the light sheet microscopy. So, the stimulated Raman histology incorporates the AI based diagnostic pipeline and there has been a study on the brain tumor wherein they have um, uh, used this uh, model to diagnose 10 most common brain tumors using these images in a trial of 278 patients and they found that the diagnosis given by this is nowhere inferior to the board certified neuropathologist. So these can be used as a standalone method for evaluation whenever you do not have a specialist pathology and also to improve your diagnostic accuracy even in centers where you are well staffed. So this is an example of the, uh, of the Raman uh, histology, stimulated Raman histology wherein there is AI and it uh, captures the, the images and it uh, identifies the areas of interest according to the information which has been uh, fed into it. Our previous speakers have told us about the machine learning, deep learning and neural network. So it incorporates all of this and converts these uh, uh, conventional HND slides into the areas of interest and highlights the areas uh, and uh, it might assist the pathologist. The other one which is coming up latest is the light sheet microscopy. So normally whatever current pathology methods we are using give a two-dimensional view. But it is very troublesome when you want to assess the vessels, lymphatics and glands. So they cannot be captured in depth. So you can go for a 3D dimension. This gives the spatial relationships between various cell types and helps us to accurately diagnose. So an advantage is you're not cutting the tissue, you're not distorting the tissue, but you're using the three-dimensional uh, magnification and different uh, views to identify the, the depth of, uh, uh, of the lesion and this is able to give you much more information. So the view for the future is that it will help us to increase the total sampling volume, it will help us to analyze the intact tissue, digitize the data, maintain the sample integrity and reduce dependence on manual processing. In vivo uh, microscopic applications have been used and one of that is the confocal laser, uh, laser endomicroscopy which is used by our gastroenterologists and uh, basically this also incorporates AI and um, it helps um, them to have a visual uh, uh, imagination of the tissue as seen in morphology under the endoscopy. So if you see here it is able to identify the capsule the cortex of the lymph node, the fat cells of the uh, lymph node and the cells with abnormal cells so that during the procedure the surgical or the medical gastroenterologists uh, are also able to, uh, to analyze that yes are we dealing with a metastatic lymph node. So um, this is widely used in practice at our hospital for example a 56 year old male 
who was having a suspicion of a short segment Barrett's esophagus. We have latest modifications on the endoscopy with the light micro endoscopy, the narrow band imaging, which are different uh, modifications of the endoscopy, which give you much more details to identify the salmon colored patch, uh, which might be missed if it's a very short segment. And by using confocal um, endoscopy, they are able to exactly identify these goblet cells which form a definition for Barrett's mesophagus. So without even before doing the, the biopsy, the gastroenterologist uh, is using the AI to identify the Barrett's esophagus which is nothing but a columnar lined mucosa with intestinal metaplasia and also the confocal microscope is also able to identify areas of dysplasia which is very important um, uh, uh, treatment decision pointer to decide whether the patient should be kept under follow-up or should be uh, should undergo surgery. So um, all this has paved the pay, uh, pathway for the third revolution or the artificial intelligence in pathology and uh, they are definitely exciting times as pathology seems to be poised to take advantage of all the advances in microscopy and computation. But why do we need AI in pathology? So today is the era of precision medicine and precision medicine means precision diagnosis. The pathologist diagnosis is based on the histological uh, slides. So um, this was the center for the cancer care and um, that as I've shown you in the previous studies, they can be scope. I'm not saying that they will be scope. They can be scope of one to two percent of inter and intra observer variation when you are analyzing a tumors of such huge volume and when the um, when you have to assess certain important cytomorphological features like mitosis or uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes which are very tedious repetitive tasks and and uh, which may sometimes be very difficult for a pathologist so ai uh, is anticipated to help the pathologist in this transition from providing more than a, a qualitative description to a more quantitative result and um, as we have already seen, um, they will, uh, the AI will play a role of a digital assistant to the pathologist because AI will not replace the pathologist, but AI will help the pathologist in identifying and quantifying more lesions. For example, in head and neck cancers, you have the tumor and tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So to count the number of lymphocytes um, is a very tedious task, but the tumor uh, infiltrating lymphocytes definitely have a prediction in uh, further treatment. So by using AI, it will help us to delineate the tumor from the lymphocytes and give the accurate count. So basically AI will automate the diagnostic process and it will enable the pathologists to apply their cognitive resources for a higher level of diagnostic and consultative tasks. And um, this is particularly when the benefits are not only in diagnosis, but also in prognosis, diagnostics, as well as in teaching. So what is the role? One, it might help in the pathologist to identify micro deposits in the lymph nodes. So as you all know, in all oncology related cases, there is a minimum cutoff of number of lymph nodes we have to evaluate. For example, in the, uh, in the GI, you have to at least evaluate 16 lymph nodes in the stomach and in the rectum. And the T1, T2, T3 is based on, the, uh, sorry, N1, N2, N3 are based on the number of lymph nodes. So even if you miss one uh, lymph node, you might undergrade the tumor. So the chances of uh, treatment may be missed. Second is in this glissance grading, which we have already discussed. And uh, third is in, um, in the IFC, which I'll show in the subsequent uh, cases. And also in assessing the resection margins. And also in gynecological uh, cytology, particularly in pap smears. AI has revolutionized in that you have a completely automated microscope when the as you have seen uh, in one of the microscopes which we have here it is much more higher version where if the slide is um, kept on the microscope it will map the areas of uh, dysplasia and those um, 10 or 15 areas are then projected into one more uh, system so the pathologist need not see the 100 images and the pathologist will just get to view those 10 areas and so the chances of missing uh, tumor is less. Uh, so for example, as we were talking about lymph nodal metastasis, uh, AI can improve the sensitivity to as much as 91%. So if you see this first um, image here, uh, AI is using uh, the contours and identifying these areas of micrometastasis. So here also is an area of micrometastasis. 
Macros when the entire node is replaced, it's very easy. But it's only the micro metastasis which can sometimes be even less than this. So AI will help to identify those areas. And uh, we have uh, seen the prostate uh, slides. So if you see here, this is the slide wherein AI is uh, mapping the, the areas and identifying the areas and you are using different colors to identify whether it is glisten score 3 or 4. In the last picture, if you see, the yellow colors are all glisten pattern 3 and the uh, red one is glisten pattern 4. So a pathologist can compare what was their glisten pattern 3 and 4 and correlate with the AI to know how and reduce the inter and intra observer variation for a more efficient uh, and um, effective report. So now, as we said, there is a lot of paradigm shift in the treatment. The earlier concept was any patient with cancer, treat them with one particular kind of drug. But that doesn't work today because um, we are going for uh, individualized medicine according to their um, genomics, according to their lifestyle, according to their history, medical records. And accordingly, the uh, patient is evaluated as to what uh, uh, treatment he should be given. So, uh, pathologists play a very key role in immuno-oncology um, as now you know that immunotherapy is by using drugs which can suppress or stimulate the immune system and uh, IHC will help to analyze and identify those patients who will respond to immune therapy. So, we use IHCs for uh, various markers and AI will actually help in this uh, field. For example, this is a, a male patient uh, with history of recurrent hypoglycemia, known case of MEN1 syndrome. On EUS, he had a multiple SOS in the head and body of pancreas. FNA was done and FNA diagnosis was neuroendocrine tumor. So here, um, a rap one is rapid onsite diagnosis. Two is collecting the material for adequate further testing. So the third picture is the cell block. Now, once we collect material for the cell block, the main role is now to grade the tumor. Uh, now, in neuroendocrine tumors, you have grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. Grade 1 is when the KI 67 is less than 2%. Grade 2 is if it is 2 to 20 and grade 3 is more than 20. So, we, uh, pathologists will not have any difficulty in, in grade 3 because obviously it's very high, it's more than 20. But what is crucial is grade 1 and grade 2. What I might interpret as 2% and other pathologists might interpret as 3%. But that 1% can change the grade from grade 1 to grade 2. And this is very important because this will pave the path for whether the patient requires further therapy and everybody is aware with the Steve Jobs cancer who had a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. So this is the first figure which I have saying where the percentage is less, this uh, is one person. But the second one, you can have difficulty whether it is three or five, so also the third grade. And um, it's very important that we have a correct diagnosis because the many studies have shown that there's a lot of prognostic implication of the grading system and um, this paves the path for further therapy. So you have an AI module called immuno ratio, wherein you scan the slide showing the highest area of KI67 and upload it in this immuno ratio method and it will give you a calculation of the KI67. And uh, for example, the second figure, it is calculated and it is said that it is 48%. So this will help. Uh, and this is the third picture, which is using AI. It is identifying the um, the hot uh, spots and giving the KI67. So uh, this uh, AI plays a critical role here. And a lot of studies have shown that uh, there's, there's much uh, development of AI in digital pathology and in GI cancers. And this study has shown that more than 55% of the biomarker identification after triage and they have further demonstrated that the AI system can improve the operational efficiency and support the clinical decision into a more realistic care. And also by using AI, right now we are doing microsatellite instability. We are doing either by IHC or we are doing by NGS. There is a study which is going on which can predict MSI directly from the HID slides. So there is no need to do for IHC. This is still under uh, uh, evaluation and uh, this is um, uh, uh, a very potential uh, thing which we can uh, use in the coming future. And a lot of um, studies um, have helped in breast pathology. For example, in breast pathology, manually a pathologist has to use a Nottingham histological grading wherein we will see what is the tubule formation and we give a score uh, which is for the grade. We will count the number of mitotic figures for 20 hyperfields and we will give the mitosis. 
and we'll evaluate necrosis. Then we add all these three components and we give further scoring. So this again has inter and intra observer variability. So AI is very useful in assessing these uh, mitotic counts and um, their results have shown that um, it has significantly improved the accuracy of tumor proliferation and also AI is able to identify genetic changes within the tissue which are useful for stratifying these patients and ER, PR, HER2 is very very important for uh, further treatment and um, if you see manually a pathologist has to uh, evaluate ER and PR based on proportion score and intensity so we have to see if the percentage of cells are 1 to 10 or 11 to 30 or 35 to 66 or more than 67 whether it is weak staining, intermediate staining or strong staining then add both and give a final score and then if the score is um, uh, more than um, 3 to 8 we say positive less than 3 is negative. Why is it so important because if they are ER and PR positive they are offered hormonal therapy and if they are negative they are given chemotherapy so this is very important so AI algorithms have used to improve this and help the pathologists uh, to give a more accurate diagnosis because uh, HER2 is one more area wherein um, if you have a one and uh, it is negative but if it is two you have to confirm it further by FISH uh, and if FISH comes positive consider it as uh, true positive so maybe in such lines um, AI will be very important and PDL1 is currently just to show that we have to count the tumor cells and we have to count the non-tumor cells and we give a tumor proportion score and a combined proportion score uh, which is very very uh, difficult um, for a non-experienced um, uh, pathologist. So um, AI is uh, playing a very pivotal role and if you see PDL1 now is being used in variety of cancers and um, it's basically um, used uh, to give immunotherapy for the patient. And in 2013, we know that Angelina Jolie tested positive for BRCA1 and this paved way now for the complete um, NGS panel and now we are doing more than 300 to 500 genes. We are quantifying the tumor and further AI has um, uh, been evaluated in stage 1 and 2 uh, positive tumors in HER2 negative and according to this, an artificial scoring, if you get a score of less than 15, the patient is at low risk for recurrence so they need not go for therapy. So, um, the currently it's a next generation or an augmented pathology report wherein in addition to the pathologist report, we also will use AI and give a combined uh, uh, prognostic score. Of course, there are many hurdles, but the way ahead is to have a uh, collaboration between the scientists, the industry and the pathologists. And uh, we know that pathologists cannot be replaced, but they are uh, digital assistants. And... Um, Glad to end that uh, future of reporting is already uh, here in AIG uh, with uh, G. Rao sir who has introduced me to this uh, one as early as 8 years uh, back. Um, with this, uh, thank you and I'm open to any questions. So we'll move on to the next speaker and we'll take questions after the second.
So we just initiated a trial. Uh, we do multiple things uh, uh, with imaging, and I'll go in a little more detail. Um, we also do a lot of modeling, so acoustic modeling. So how do these waves actually propagate? So if you're doing shock wave lithotripsy, um, can we understand the effect of, let's say, fat or different tissues? Um, uh, does the um, you know the texture of the stone or the type of the stone that you're trying to break up actually matter? Um, so you're saying five thousand or pulses, um, is that consistent through for everybody? Does it work? Uh, it's not working and it's causing these side effects. Is that something we can model to better understand? And that's something that we do. We also make our own sensors in the lab. Uh, so for example, if you put these uh, transfusers on the skin surface for therapy, how do you know the contact is sufficient enough not to cause skin burns? Or how do you know what is the temperature of the skin? Because oftentimes when acoustic energy uh, hits even the thinnest layer of air, you get a lot of reflection and that can cause anywhere between first, second and even third degree burns. And that's something that we've experienced in, in the past. Um, we have a current trial ongoing at, at another hospital in Hyderabad uh, on liquid biopsy. So we've already gotten 25 patients with follow-up, uh, patients who've not been treated with triple breast cancer and subsequent therapy of cyclophosphamide, doxorubicin, and followed by paclitaxel, three cycles each. Um, and then we're basically sampling the blood every uh, time step as well as the tumor uh, whenever it's available. Um, and then there's a lot of things that we do. Uh, so we're actually building, uh, again, you know, as engineers, we build stuff. So we are, I think, almost done building uh, uh, a setup that can convert your 2D ultrasound probes into a 3D probe. So we have the software, we have the hardware. So in a sense, hospitals, clinics, uh, people who can't afford to buy 3D probes or most 3D probes don't have all the modes in them. So for example, you for if, if you'd like to do low flow Doppler, let's say if you want to understand placental Doppler, you know, how does blood flow in the placenta as this is an example. I mean, that's not a very high flow uh, like the carotid artery, for example. And so uh, there are sequences available in commercial systems, but only available on one of their transducers and not on the 3D transducer. So we have the hardware and the software that can actually convert whatever you're doing on the 2D probe into a 3D volume. So I'll just show you a little bit of what we're doing. Um, the unmet need and the reason I'm focusing on this, especially for the therapeutic ultrasound standpoint, is because that is our sweet spot and that's what we're actually mostly focused on is, is uh, we think that whatever we're doing um, can produce a systemic cytokine and cellular response and we can show you some initial data to support that as well as how the genetic expression after you treat actually evolves and changes to therapy alone um, and we've also tracked antigen release and these timings to the lymph nodes and that is a very critical aspect when you're treating solid tumors especially once they become metastatic and so how does this presentation occur 
I think Dr. Anuradha was talking about PDL1. Um, oftentimes, when patients, I think, again, this is where if I make a mistake, please stop me. Uh, when you get to the end of line of therapy that's approved, uh, you are now in the dark and you either shoot for immunotherapy or you don't. And it's it's it's, it's sometimes driven by financial factors, logistic factors. Uh, but we don't sample them anymore. Different locations in the body may present different antigens. And so how are you going to be more responsive? Obviously, melanoma is a great example and a poster child, but that doesn't work every time. Uh, here's uh, basically uh, an image uh, of, of uh, currently and commercially available MR-guided uh, hypo system. Uh, initially sold by Philips, and right now the hypo part is sold by Profound Medical. Um, and a couple of uh, ultrasound-guided hypo systems, one specific for prostate on the left and on the right, very specific for the breast. It's called Theracleon Echo Pulse. Um, and there's very few people who are using it. Uh, the Echo Pulse, the Theracleon Echo Pulse is actually manufactured by somebody in France and there's only one or two sites in the US that are currently using it. So it's kind of a very small limited market for some reason. So um, I think these waveforms may be uh, um, uh, obvious to some people who are doing shockwave lithotripsy. So these are basically ultrasound shocks that you produce when you increase the amount of acoustic power. So when you say electric power converts to acoustic power, converts to acoustic pressure, it's these, this pressure that you use either for imaging and that's how the quality of imaging looks like. Now, obviously on your diagnostic imaging device, you can't change that. That's because it's FDA approved. If it's FDA approved and labeled as such, you can never touch the power. You can reduce the power, but at the maximum power is possibly what you're all using. On the therapy side, there is no quote unquote FDA approval. Uh, and most of the things that we're doing right now is still sort of experimental or dedicated to specific applications and it's been approved. So for example, it's approved for uterine fibroids, it's approved for osteoosteoma, it's approved for essential tremor and a couple of other indications. However, um, the manner in which we can change can create these non-linear waveforms. So this, you can think of this sawtooth kind of waveform as somebody punching really hard and then you slowly draw back and then punch really hard again and slowly draw back. The x-axis is microseconds. So if you keep punching the tissue and slowly draw, you create these bubbles, the tissue. And subsequent punches will burst these bubbles. When the bubble bursts, you essentially create what is called as a boiling effect in the order of microseconds. The so tissue boils, creates these bubbles and bursts. And when that happens, you start lysing it, right? So we basically uh, used an MR to understand what kind of temperatures to expect. Uh, so if you look at the coronal slices, the first and the second coronal slices are two millimeters away from each other. And uh, uh, you know, the temperatures are vastly different. You know, at the center of the focus, you're about 80, 90. So yeah, you're creating this boiling effect, this bubble and a lot of other things going on, uh, tissue lysis and so on. But the moment you're two millimeters and farther away, your temperature drops. And so that can be tuned depending on what we're trying to treat or break up. So this lysis is what I'm referring to can show up on the top panel, which is a, a T1 weighted, the bottom panel is T2 weighted axial, top one is T1 weighted coronal. Um, and then basically figure number C and F are subtraction images. The, the, the takeaway message here is the lysis that we create has very spatially precise shapes and sizes and volumes, and that essentially can also be controlled. And we are lysing it, leaving the boundary completely intact. Now, the parameter dependence is quite a bit. So the kind of parameters you use can affect the type of tissue damage you can create or type of lysis you can create. And so that's what we're demonstrating here. What you can create is a large amount of temperature increase, so it's thermal ablation, let's say RF ablation, microwave ablation. Um, so we can do that along with some little bit of lysis, or we just don't increase the temperature bare minimum. We don't even touch 50 degrees Celsius just at the focus. If you look at the second panel and completely lyse the tissue. The cool part about lysing the tissue is releasing this intracellular ectoplasmic antigens to the extracellular space. So now you have all these exogenous uh, presentations into the lymph nodes. Uh, so possible MHC1 activation and so on. Um, and then we can obviously punch a hole. So uh, 
you come to the lab, I think our lab guys are now fairly well trained that they tell you don't turn it on until I show up uh, because you can punch a hole. So if you put your finger and it's coupled, you'll start burning your skin, you'll start chopping it away before you realize, you know, pieces of the skin start coming off very quickly. So that's the kind of power we can operate on. So, you know, we're talking about the higher range. So it doesn't happen. It has never happened. Um, so uh, I think I think Dr. Anandana spoke a little bit about immunotherapy, and and so we basically looked at the preclinical model of uh, of neuroblastoma. Now, obviously, uh, this is a gastroenterology specific uh, group, uh, but but I'm just showing what we did on the neuroblastoma, and the reason is neuroblastoma, especially with Micken amplified, uh, the outcomes are fairly poor. Uh, so uh, we took a model that had Micken amplification, and then what we saw is once we grew large tumors, is when you combine it with immunotherapy. So if you break up the tumor in sparse locations, so it's like Swiss cheese. So you know Swiss cheese has these holes in the middle with everything else intact. So all you do is a Swiss cheese pattern and you combine it with Nemo and Epilumumab. Nemolumab and Epilumumab. You basically cure the tumor. And, and it, it basically sustains for over 300 days. Okay? And we were curious why. So we did a bunch of stains and things. So the takeaway message here is we looked at uh, CD68 positive, which is a pan macrophage marker, and CD4 and CD8. If you look at the first column, which is untreated, it's completely cold tumor. I mean, I'm only showing you one slide, so I guess I can cheat you with that. But we also did flow cytometry and a bunch of you know hundreds of slides. It's it's a completely cold tumor. There is no infiltrate. Maybe a little bit of macrophages, but somebody can argue these are probably resident M2 macrophages, M2 phenotype macrophages, and so you know they tend to be pro-tumoral and so on, which I don't know the answer to the question, but what we know is if you just leave the tumor as is, the mouse will die. So it's possibly suggestive of that. You hit it with this IPO technique, you mechanically break it up, and the infiltration significantly starts going up. So maybe we did something to the immune system. So then we said, what is it that we're doing it? Uh, so again, slightly busy slide. Uh, the top left is DX5. DX5 is a NK pan NK marker. So uh, uh, I, I don't know if it's NK or NK T cell, but it's a pan NK. Uh, but what we know for a fact is you did wake up the innate immune system in the spleen and in the draining lymph node. So something is going on there. Um, one thing I'd like you to sort of uh, so so if you see the CD8 alpha positive. Uh, dendritic cells in the spleen and in the draining lymph node, which is your second row, third column. Um, these are very specific type of dendritic cells. Um, they are not your normal monocyte differentiated dendritic cells. Their specific function is to present exogenous uh, soluble antigens to MHC1 complex. And so that's cool, which means that you potentially have immediate immediate alpha positive activation. So all you need is a bunch of these presenting in the draining lymph node and then subsequently creating a larger uh, differentiation of your T cells into CD8 alpha positive T cells. Um, in several solid tumors, it's also known, I think, that the ratio of your cytotoxic T cells to your regulatory T cells is key to survival and key to improved outcomes, clinical outcomes, not just radiological. And so what we've seen is that the CD8 alpha positive FOXP3 to FOXP3 ratios in the spleen and the draining lymph node constantly go up. So looking at the third and fourth column and the fourth row, the bottom column. So that was slightly encouraging, suggesting what was going on. We also basically punctured the hearts of these mice. We drew blood. Each, each data point is 10 mice at uh, each time point. And uh, what we saw is IL2 is up. Makes sense, so you are possibly activating NK cells. So maybe IL2 went up signaling NK. NK was signaled because there's immediate injury, but IL2 also helps lymphocyte signaling. So possibly there was something there. Um, what we also saw is VGFA constantly keeps going down and significantly down at the end of day three. Um, IL10 significantly down regulates. So that's great news, which means your TGF beta becomes very quiet because IL10 is the one that signals TGF beta one and two. Um, and so, although our TGF beta 1 and 2 are inconclusive in this case, I think the fact that IL-10 is down-regulating, that we do not have a resistive environment, we have a more cytotoxic. Oh, the last takeaway thing is the interferon gamma. So, it's very interesting. So, we hit these mice, the mice are in pain, so we have to give them buprenorphine. Um, if you don't give them buprenorphine, 
every 12 hours for three doses they will die it's, it's painful because we've disrupted a bunch of tissue but interferon gamma never went up and so it was a bit surprising i mean so what is i mean what kind of cytokines then go up i mean you know it's a um, and then we uh, looked at uh, a bunch of genes. I'm just going to go back to the previous slide later. We looked at a bunch of genes. So we did an entire microarray and then we repeated a set of genes that we thought was of interest to us, uh, which are a subset of DAMs or danger associated or damage associated molecular patterns. And uh, repeated it for three different housekeeping genes just to make sure that we are not seeing weird patterns. Good patterns were consistent. Good. good. But there's one particular gene called CD72 at the bottom row, and that was upregulated by 8.9 fold approximately on day one and starts going down by day three. We don't know that for a fact. Somebody else has reported that CD72 upregulation makes sure that interferon gamma is not produced. So if CD72 gene is more active, your interferon gamma does not get produced. So that about makes sense. We said, okay, so in our story, we said possible, we don't know for a fact, but this is a possible. But the reason why I was more excited is PDL1 expression, this is DAPI and then PDL1, only went up on day three, but otherwise never went up. And this was consistent uh, over 10 mice. So the um, distribution of PD1 is basically what we calculated automatically. Um, which means we know for a fact that PDL1 upregulation was interferon gamma mediated. That's great news. The tumor thought it was smart. The moment we hit it and something else happened, it immediately showed up PDL1 upregulation. Now we have a weapon in hand. You go hit it with anti PDL1. So now you've at least taken out one of the many defenses. Does it have other defenses? Possibly, but in this case, not good enough. We took care of CTLA4 so that it takes care of your lymphocytes, and so you had a pretty decent uh, anti tumor. Um, does this work only locally? We then did over 20 mice uh, bilateral tumors, 10 millimeter each on each side, uh, treated only one side. And the way you can see is on the right, for example, the hair is still growing. You know, as you can see, after inoculation, the hair is growing back. But on the left is the treated side, so we shave it before we treat because we don't want these air bubbles to be formed under the skin. So we shave just before we do ultrasound therapy. So we treated the left uh, and we did not touch the right side of the tumor and both go away. And you see that consistently for over 18 mice and that stays for 300 days. So we first did the unilateral, waited for 300 days. We said, okay, great news. Now we did two sides and then we waited for 300 days. It looks like it's there. But then the question is, what happens if you, if I give them five times the tumor? So we gave them a million cells to grow tumor. I gave them five million cells. And so the first figure is essentially showing none of them regrow tumors again. Again, you know, we've all cured cancer in mice. So I'm not trying to go, you know, go into saying this is the best. But um, all we are trying to say in the second and the third figures is there was once you isolate the splenocytes, there was an upregulation in, um, you know, your CD44 and 62 low, 44 high and 62 low, which is your effector memory part of your lymphocyte. So significantly upregulated in mice that were re-inoculated with the tumor compared to naive mice that had never seen the tumor before. So they had no memory. So if you had a fresh set of mice, you injected it, the 44 high, 62 low, each, I mean, uh, each, each data set. So the one on the left is 10 mice. The one on the right was all our mice that were living. So you're looking at 18 plus or what have you. And, 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 and so suggested that they had some memory response. Does this mean it's a vaccine? I don't want to stretch it. We don't know the answer to that. Um, so uh, very quickly, then I'm going to wrap up. I think Dr. Rupchati gave me 20 minutes. So I'm just going to quickly wrap up. Uh, we have some experience doing pediatric solid tumors. Uh, this is a desmoid tumor in, in, in a child, a thermal ablation. Um, the tumor grew back. We tried this in rhabdo, our tumor grew back. Uh, in rhabdo and in Wilms, uh, metastatic cases, they all died. They often show up when they're metastatic because it's an experimental therapy. So they all died, unfortunately. The desmoid ended up in surgical therapy. Uh, I mean, surgical resection. 
Um, but all we're trying to show here is that we're able to successfully deliver the energy where we want it to in a spatially precise manner, and that works. So that's what was the goal of this trial. Uh, so here's sort of a snapshot of the machine that we've built in the lab. And the first two, the bottom ones are sort of uh, CAD renderings, but the first two of these will be delivered by the end of next week. At least that's what our shop floor guys promised me uh, on the phone today. So they said, sir, by Friday it will be ready. So we're going to have these two, and the goal is to start treating some breast tumors. At least that's what we're aiming to at the beginning. Uh, but I'm happy to discuss with others. Uh, very quickly, we've also started a clinical trial uh, in a different location where we're trying to understand this, this histopathological heterogeneity that everybody talks about in the case of triple negative breast cancer. And are those signatures possibly picked up using shear wave elastography? Because shear wave elastography gives you Young's margins values or shear wave speeds. So can we pick that up? So we're doing 3D shear wave elastography in breast tumors. Uh, so the trial is approved to do 500 patients. So we think that around this time next year, we would have recruited all 500 patients. Um, again, you know, computational uh, uh, modeling uh, that we do. So I'm just not going to go into that. So these are sensors that we built. The middle figure is showing you some scanning electron microscopy uh, that we've done just a few weeks ago. Uh, so my student is writing up. I hopefully he'll submit soon. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we're at the mercy of my students. Uh, and then this is the genomics work that we did. We've created a framework to actually um, filter out the genes that are key to a particular type of breast tumor. Um, although, and, and Dr. Anuda, you have to forgive me, but, but all the BRCA1 is the poster child gene for a lot of these breast tumors. It's it's driven by uh, this, 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 uh, um, uh, subsequent effects, uh, uh, familial effects, especially in African-American women and in the North America. But there's also a bunch of these other genes that also play a significant role in proliferation um, and, 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 and uh, essentially therapy resistance. And so we've come up with these essentially a framework. All you do is if somebody does uh, a 51 panel, 171 panel, 700 panel, you plug it into our framework. Uh, our framework gives you a scoring. And based on the scoring, you just go after a bunch of genes and then you know which one is playing a stronger role. So do you have therapies for those? If you don't have therapy for the first one, you go to the second one, to the third one, and so on and so forth. Are there indirect therapies to do? And so that is something that we've done. Um, very quickly, we've done some placental work. We are restarting that. Uh, so I'm very interested in understanding the placenta because trophoblast migration is actually dented in the case of preeclampsia. Um, and unfortunately, in preeclampsia, the way we do it is, you know, we just do blood pressure and protein urea and we say, yeah, yeah you have preeclampsia. And then you just give them some dilators. Uh, but what we're trying to do is see if we can diagnose them early on. So when I say early on, week 14, and we start week 14, week 16, start warning them saying, I think you're headed that way. Because the official clinical diagnosis around week 20, 21 to 24, they tend to show up to the hospital and the BP is high or they feel giddy or, or, or any of those symptoms. So something of that uh, in, in, in that trial. So we've done some clinical trials. The takeaway message here is shear wave elastography definitely shows a significant difference in Young's modulus or stiffness of the placenta between preeclamptic placentas versus healthy placentas. And, and I think the last thing that we have here is, you know, these bottom panels are showing you, this is my forearm, uh, basically showing you fascicles in my forearm in 3D using a 2D probe. Software is able to sort of give you either, you know, like a, like a CT or an MRI, you know, multiple slices, or we can reconstruct the volume. We can also, if you're interested, you know, draw a few circles around my radial artery in one of the axial slices and then reconstruct the entire artery in 3D. Uh, but that's something that you won't even get in your 3D ultrasound. Group. So that is something that we do. So here are a few clinical trials that we have ongoing. I am very keen in working with more people in this space, plus or minus anything else that is of interesting. Uh, I will tell you if I'm not good at it. Uh, so, uh, thank you. So, great talk and thanks for keeping to the time. So, uh, since we have some other thing going on, so can we quickly have some questions and comments? Yes, 
uh, I'm not sure if they're available right now, but I am very anxious. So he really like to talk to you. I think I think we briefly. For diagnostic just, purpose, we are already using probes to go inside. Correct. The, the, the difference fragments. between diagnostic and therapy is heat dissipation of the transducer element and the type of the material you use for transducer and the frequencies. So we may have to knock it off, put another one, but. I think the best way to start is maybe if you can show me your probe and if you can if, if I can dig out the you know the properties of the transducer element who knows the, the, the maybe the fastest way is we unplug it put it into the amplifier I have and then we can do what we like or we may have to replace that and we know the right people who can replace it and put it for us that we can so we can discuss thank you thank you Stop. Thank yeah. you. No, so so right now we've only sequenced or we've done whole exome of the tissue. So we have VCS file, VCF files that my student is basically now sifting through the data. Depending on the kind of expression he sees, we will select those for the blood. So we are working with Newberg, and Newberg is the one who's doing the sequencing for. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know that yet. 25 patients, so literally looking at the data, right? We have not looked at the blood yet, but we are not, so Newberg has recommended a bunch of panels and we said we don't want your panel. We want to tell you what we want to go after. Congratulations. Really mind blowing work. I'm Dr. Avinash and from Medical Oncology. So, when I looked at uh, the data that you presented, I have three uh, three uh, questions. One is the the distribution of the cytokines. Was it intratumoral or was it systemic that you have measured? Uh, these are puncture in the heart. So, so those are systemic. So they, they are all systemic. That the, the the systemic. So the response that you had that is the making the tumor cold from hot. I'm sorry, from cold to hot was. That was measured systemically. So two things. What we did is this is intratumoral effect. Of the what levels we of did. VEGF, the levels of uh, yeah, the interferon one. gamma. Correct. They're so all those were intratumoral. No, measures. no, 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 no. So they were systemically so, measured. Oh, oops. Oh, they, I'm so sorry. I thought they were showing. So I'm pointing my hand at That's myself. Nice. The, <laughs> the, the, all the cytokines and the cellular response. So cytokines were basically heart draws. So uh, there. So all of this was cardiac drop, so it's systemic. Okay. The cellular responses were done based on the tissue side. So either spleen, draining lymph node, contralateral lymph node, okay. or tumor. Okay. And the staining was done only in the tumor. This, the, the expression of the, the CD4, CD8 axis, the expression of T legs and NK axis was done intertumorally. I mean, these were on the tumors, right? These are all tumors. This is all flow cytometry from, let's say, the spleen, draining lymph node, contralateral lymph node, and so on. Okay. Right. So we basically took the tumor out, single cell suspensions did flow. After subjecting this, were all the mice splenectomized and then looked at the same signature in the spleen as well? Uh, I'm sorry. So after after you have got the uh, after you have elicited this uh, immune response, yeah, yeah. were the mice? subjected to a splenectomy and then did we look at the signatures in the spleen as well? Yeah, so, so for example, the top left is the spleen. And so we first treated a bunch of mice and once we saw a therapy response, we took new mice, we injected the tumor, we did the therapy and at each time point, we did 10 mice. We took out the spleens, single cell suspension and then stained them with either, you know, multiple of these markers, I think, we had the ability to stain seven at a time or eight at a time. And so we stained them and then we counted them. Different locations. So spleen, drain lymph node, contralateral lymph node, yeah. and tumor. Uh, I think stains are great to look at. They're very colorful and nice. Flow gives you the whole thing. Stain gives you spatial tempo, I mean, spatial uh, sort of. Yeah. So, uh, uh, again, during our treatment also. Uh, to make a cold tumor hot, various methods. When you subject the tumor to any sort of injury, like, like the histotripsy or whether it's radiotherapy, surgery, what happens is that the tumor becomes hot, but it doesn't it doesn't usually sustain that. So when post radiotherapy, or this is this is in particular proclivity for those cold tumors. 
the biliary tract, urinary bladder cancer. Relatively cold tumors, not unlike a melanoma or a Hodgkin lymphoma, which are really they have a lot of tumors. mutations, huge uh, number of mutations. So in those tumors, following up or giving uh, following up uh, uh, this sort of therapy, and uh, me going ahead and giving immunotherapy, really would want to know how long this would actually stay, and is it uniform across all the tumor sites? So usually, usually at various metastases, you know, like you have a liver mat or a lung mat is this uniform across so uh, you know really interesting to look at this work. Last, uh, how advantageous is this over other method mechanisms like aerotherapy or doing an rfa or a microwave how do you sell it against all these so that let's say in future let's say that i usually have uh, say i have a patient who is having cancer and want to give them immunotherapy i want to make the tumor hot so where do you put histotripsy in these, uh, you know, uh, available? Uh, uh, yeah. So, so to very quickly answer your, your your second question. So your second question is I don't know the answer to this. I have no idea, and then that's where I need to work with people like you to figure that out slowly on a clinical trial. I mean, I can do whatever I want in mice. So what? I mean, but all I'm trying to tell you is we created a window. The window was. 24 to 48 hours. So you see everything is jumping up in the 24 hour window. A lot of things going on in the 24 hour window. So at the first date, so 24 hours after our therapy was when we injected our first immunotherapy compound. It worked best. And then came two days gap, second dose, two days gap, third day. But now how does that work in human? So that's why one of the trials that we are initiating at UMC, at University Medical Center, Doing this boiling histotripsy in combination with NEVO in triple negative and neuroblastoma and static refractory relapse uh, cases um, just to see what goes on. But we should slowly scale back to potentially treatment naive because you know the, the refractoriness is lesser as you go closer to you know try to answer your third question. I do have a bias to ultrasound, we don't ionize, so pediatric great. Uh, we possibly won't create new mutations, but we are fairly confident, like radiation therapy. Um, if you had, let's say, multifocal liver tumors, I'm not going to put six holes, seven holes in your tummy to reach them. So we can do this completely. Same thing with the breast. I don't have to make holes in it. There's a cosmetic issue related to it. So I think from pediatric, cosmetic, and non-invisible approach, why I think I'm trying to sell my head. Great to go. Thank you. I think next step is a randomized control trial to look at the comparison which is better. Right? So I think if there are no too many questions, um... yeah. so I'd uh, like to uh, invite Dr. Reddy to the place for a little felicitation.